It was the Atlantic that first warned us back in September of 2016, take Trump seriously, but not literally. It was framed as the main mistake the press had been making. And since then, we've all learned we should not take the president literally, but can we even take him seriously anymore either? On Saturday, he spoke at a rally in Pennsylvania, which is supposed to be for the Republican congressional candidate, but instead featured a slew of insults hurled at both the media and at Democrats. Can you imagine covering Bernie or Pocahontas? Pocahontas. And Maxine Waters, a very low IQ individual. You ever see her? Not to mention his solution for the country's drug problem. The death penalty. I think it's a discussion we have to start thinking about. Don't you agree? I don't know if you're ready. I don't know if this country's ready for it. We're supposed to take that seriously? And then there was his tough talk on commissions. We can't just keep setting up blue ribbon committees. And they talk, 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 talk. Two hours later, then they write a report. Strange then that the very next day, one of the key gun safety proposals unveiled by the White House was a commission on federal school safety. They're also calling for federal money to train school staff to carry concealed weapons. They support tightening loopholes in the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, known as NICS. They want to ban bump stocks and add those red flag laws we talked about here the other day, which would let people petition courts to remove firearms from people deemed a threat. One notable item not on the list of proposals is raising the minimum wage to buy a gun from 18 to 21, an idea the president was pushing hard just two weeks ago. Remember this exchange between Trump and Republican Senator Toomey? It doesn't make sense that I have to wait till I'm 21 to get a handgun, but I can get this weapon at 18. I was just curious as to what you did in your bill. We, you don't we, didn't, we didn't address it, Mr. President. Look, I think you know we, why? Because you're afraid of the NRA, right? <laughs> so who's afraid of the NRA now? Join me to discuss our freelance journalist, Joanna Weiss. Hi, Joanna. Nice to see you. Dante Ramos is editor of the Ideas section of the Boston Globe. Good to see you both. So Donald Trump's 180 on this, Joanna. Is this just Trump being Trump? Or as I just said here, has he decided, like he accused Toomey of being, essentially scared of the NRA? I mean, I think Trump, as we have seen, is influenced by the last person who talked to him in a serious way. And clearly the last person who talked to him was aligned with the NRA. I mean, he's, he's swung pretty wildly on guns since Parkland. He's, he responds to emotion. So right after the shooting, he sounded like a guy who was open to all kinds of gun controls. Well, a week NRA later, with all those yeah, legislators, yeah, yeah. it was pretty tough, too. And then, you know, time goes by, the pressure gets higher, the people, you know, closer to the NRA, NRA and or a get closer to his ear, and all of a sudden he starts to change his tune. You buy that? Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. In the after Parkland happened, it was uh, a. Uh, seemed like it could be a game changer in the uh, gun control dispute, but the the practice of the gun rights lobby has been to just wait stuff out, and uh, this this is one that I think they had to wait out a little bit longer. But I think they're making the calculation at the White House if they just kind of slow roll any changes, then um, we'll go back to the status quo. But if your thesis, your joint thesis, is right, then it's theoretically possible two days from now he could strengthen this with universal background checks and raise the age again. Or is this, is this the deal? I mean, I think he'll go with the things that feel safe. So bump stocks are safe, and I think the NRA is not, not posing a huge objection to that. As long as that. it's not statutory, as long as, long as it's regulatory. Well, and, I, with it. and I think he's probably come to the conclusion, and the NRA maybe too, that if they punt this to the states, there might be some changes in some places, but it's not going to be the broad sweeping changes that people thought might have been possible. You know, I am rarely optimistic about anything that really matters, but I have to say, when Rick Scott in the pocket of the NRA, the governor floor, I think that's a fair and apt description, and Republican legislators, legislators vote for not banning assault weapons, but some serious stuff, including raising the purchase age. I assume that was going to give license to people in Washington to be equally brave. But my sense is, if Trump's only going this far, that's what Republicans are doing in Congress too, no? I think they, the Republicans will go as far as they feel like they have to under the circumstances at the moment. And is this that, enough, this and that, Trump plan? And, and to the extent that the, the attention on the issue wanes, to the extent that the forum becomes the states rather than the federal government, I, I think that they feel 
accurately like they can exert power uh, in an effective way in those situations. Well, they also have the midterm elections coming up, and they're looking down the barrel at those and at those primaries and at the NRA's influence on those primaries. So they have every incentive to be as cautious as they can be. I mean, when you mention the state second ago, it sounds very much like the Obamacare thing. Do you remember early on when they were talking about repeal? They said, well, this doesn't get rid of the pre-existing uh, protection correction because uh, uh, protection because it allowed states to keep it, and it sounds like it's a variation on the same thing. They'll seize on the best from the states and ignore the worst. Is that what they do? And then essentially, despite a nationwide march in whatever it is, 10, 12 days, they're going to hide out and just pass this fix nix kind of thing? It's worked before. I mean, I think with Obamacare, um, states, if they decided to participate in Obamacare, they got money from the federal government and that the, 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 even the Republican governors of certain states felt mm -hmm. like they would lose something if they declined to participate. I think in this case, um, there is a lot of pressure at the local level, especially in, in certain swing states, that the feeling is that we've moved to a model of base activation in politics. That's what Joanna was just yeah. describing now with the, with the primary. And um, that has proved to be successful in the past, and people know that, unfortunately. So a couple of minutes ago, we played uh, Donald Trump savaging commissions. And then he decides to appoint a woman to head the commission that's going to oversee what states do on guns. Here is the woman on 60 Minutes uh, last night. We're in Michigan. This is your home state. Michi yes. Well, there's lots of great options and choices for students here. Have the public yeah. schools in Michigan gotten better? Uh, I don't know. Overall, I, I can't say overall that they have all gotten better. Have you seen the really bad schools? Maybe try to figure out what, what they're doing? I have not. I have not. I have not intentionally visited schools that are underperforming. Maybe you should. Uh, maybe I should. All three of us were like shielding our <laughs> eyes. And it, you know, there's a great line, which is not mine from Twitter this morning. Donald Trump shouldn't have sued to keep Stormy uh, uh, Daniels off 60 Minutes. He should have sued to keep her off 60 Minutes. It's obviously Betsy DeVos's education secretary. I, I am naive enough to believe, Joanna, that when on an issue that affects virtually every person in America, public education, that when you have someone on television and then it's rebroadcast who is so utterly clueless about and heartless about the basics, it hurts her boss. Am I wrong? Um, well, it's, it's hard to say that anything hurts Donald Trump with his base and that anything's going to change anyone's fundamental mind about him. But I agree. I was so stunned at how completely unprepared she unprepared. was. Unprepared. I mean, what they were basically doing, what Leslie Stahl was doing was basically relitigating or litigating the charter school debate. But with there, no gotchas. But with there no, were not no, gotcha no, questions. But, but there are plenty of people in Massachusetts who we've seen who are articulate, uh, on, articulate yeah. on the side of charter schools and can marshal statistics and facts to make that point. Betsy DeVos just was like a dear in the headlights the entire time. She just had no facts behind her. Would you come out of the house if you gave that performance last night on National <laughs> No, no, <laughs> no, of course I. not. No, but I mean, part of, part of the lack of self-awareness, I think, is one of the things that allows her to push forward in a role for which she's completely unqualified. But yeah, she seems so completely surprised to, have, to, be, to be asked questions well, on was, 60 Minutes. It was like during her confirmation hearings when it was she sort of made it clear that she was vaguely aware of schools <laughs> and that that was something that her department might be in charge of, but there wasn't a lot of uh, subject area expertise beyond that. But, you know, is, uh, it, while you sort of scoffed at the notion this may have an effect on her boss, I mean, look at the pile. Uh, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, the morning of the North Korea announcement, said we're not ready for ne direct negotiations with North Korea. The head of HUD buys a desk for $31,000. Uh, the Ed Secretary is clueless. The Attorney General is trashed virtually every day. Other cabinet members are on the front page of paper for first class rides. Is there not a point at which the weight of ineptitude and or, I hate to use the word corruption, but inappropriate behavior by virtually all of his key people becomes a problem for this president, Dante? Uh, I would hope that there would be. Uh, I think one thing that we've seen just from the last year and a half is that there hasn't been a lot of attention towards actual policy detail. Um, the fact of Betsy DeVos seeming that clueless in that conspicuous a way is, is maybe more concrete than some of the other demonstrations. But, I mean, I don't think that Betsy DeVos is obviously less qualified than, uh, you know, than Ben Carson or that, than Rick Perry at the Department of Energy. I mean, there's, the, she's about at the average level for Trump 
Cabinet well, I think that's my point, though. But when you add them all up, maybe in isolation, it's not that big a deal. People remember $31,000 dining room tables in my estimation. They remember, I think, that the Secretary of State had no idea there was a North Korea thing in the works. And it seems to me the sheer weight of these things, it's you don't well, think Well, we so. saw at the beginning of this segment whose approval Donald Trump cares about. Mm -hmm. He cares about the approval of that crowd in Pennsylvania, yeah. the people who are in his base who are going to come out and show him on a visceral personal level how much they love him by waving and screaming and trying to get selfies with him that's that's who's approval he doesn't care about the you know as much as he complains about the media i think the the number of frustrated op-eds and and you know people in the establishment who are upset that doesn't bother him that and much. we should say before we leave here that the democrat in that race in southwest pennsylvania poll today is six points up and tomorrow's the election joanne it's great to see you dante thanks so much for your time thank you I appreciate it as always